my great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Hiram Anderson, our next speaker. Uh, I am Ken Nygaard. I'm the director of the Dakota Digital Academy. Uh, the Dakota Digital Academy is the organization that knits together the 11 campuses of the university system uh, plus the five tribal colleges in the state of North Dakota. Uh, I'm also Emeritus Professor of Computer Science at North Dakota State University. Now, about our speaker, Dr. Hiram Anderson. It's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Anderson today. Um, a bit about his background. He's a distinguished uh, machine learning engineer at Robust Intelligence. Uh, PhD is from uh, University of Washington in electrical engineering. He also has degrees from Brigham Young. Uh, he has background and experience with so many organizations. Uh, some of those are MIT Lincoln Laboratory, Sandia National Laboratories, Mandiant. He's been chief scientist at Endgame, principal architect of trustworthy machine learning at Microsoft. Um, while at Microsoft, organized and uh, led uh, Microsoft's first artificial intelligence uh, red teaming efforts on production systems, chair of the AI red team governing board. Um, so many things here, applied machine learning uh, conference, uh, machine learning security evasion competition, and machine learning model attribution challenge. Um, so um, this topic is of, of great currency and relevance today. Machine learning is a very hot area. It's an area in which I'm personally very interested. And uh, Dr. Anderson will speak about security issues surrounding machine learning. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Hiram Anderson. Well, let me get, uh, thank you for the kind introduction, and a uh, pleasure to be here at University of North Dakota. Um, my career has been in using machine learning to detect cyber threats. And uh, along the way, quickly realized that the use of machine learning itself uh, to detect cyber threats was becoming a target for attackers. And so this launch, this was a pivot in my career to uh, investigate the security of this new detection technique in machine learning as a as a, a vector itself for attack. And so, you know, for this for this talk today, I want to explore what I think is an underappreciated element of cybersecurity, and that is with the rapid proliferation of machine learning. And one way to measure this is just by how companies are spending their money. So if this looks a little bit like Moore's law, it is every 18 months we've seen a doubling of revenue in uh, corporations investing in machine learning. 6,000 public companies have uh, noted that machine learning is critical to their business going forward. And you see it everywhere. You see it obviously in the, you know, the, the obvious places like Tesla's self-driving cars. There's machine learning that's not only navigating you on the road, but also monitoring you as a driver, uh, pre predicting, um, you know, calculating the, the, the distances and predict route planning to the nearest uh, recharge stations. But you see, see it in the non-obvious places also. For example, you see it uh, in, you know, what one of the customers we, we deal with uses it for matching your uh, skin tone to the appropriate shade of makeup. And literally, AI is eating the world. It's being used for predicting, for example, how to, how to optimize the weight of a Twizzlers by dictating how many twists in that licorice. So it's Halloween today. As you're eating your licorice tonight, I want you to remember that uh, AI has helped to design that. So what I want to um, stress today is that
while AI is eating the world, it also is, when companies adopt machine learning, they are also adopting the risk that comes with that. And it's not just little companies, it's big companies, uh, like my, uh, David and I have worked at Microsoft for a long time. It's big companies who adopt this. It's not AI plebeians, it's those with sophisticated security organizations and mature data science teams. So today I wanna to talk about four layers of security in machine learning adoption. And then I wanna talk about uh, how to, we can sort of begin to technologically address this and try to position this about where we are in history of the security of machine learning. So, I wanna start first with um, some of my experiences at Microsoft. Um, as was noted in the generous introduction, I, I started the Microsoft AI Red Team. And the purpose of the Red Team was to, um, was to, was, was to, to explore newly adopted AI solutions in many of our products and find what was vulnerable about them and maybe surprising. And in honor of Cybersecurity Awareness Month, the first kind of layer that I want to address today is the software stack. Um, as, as interesting as machine learning is from the modeling and math layer, it all runs on software. And the most glaring vulnerabilities are there and the most immediate. So this was evident in, uh, in our, uh, our very first AI Red Team Microsoft exercise. So for context, um, I was a, I was a uh, uh, Microsoft Research PhD intern in the, you know, the 2000s and had just re come back to Microsoft to do this exercise as a full-time employee. As such, I was still listed in the Microsoft database as an intern and had all the you know, rights and privileges of an intern. Nevertheless, uh, this is the kind of exercise we we're able to do. So the purpose of this exercise was to um, take a cloud, um, a cloud provisioning service, like similar to Azure or, or AWS or GCP, but used for internal Microsoft employees. Inside of that service was a very small machine learning model. Its job was to predict based on your request, uh, based on your request of say, I wanna spin up a VM, how I, should subs how I should allocate that request in my massive, uh, my, my massive compute warehouse. The idea behind the, the, the attack here was if we can trick this tiny little machine learning cog in this bigger system, if we can fool it, can we actually, uh, can we force this predictive behavior to, to put our payload on top of somebody else's high availability service and launch a so-called noisy neighbor attack? So uh, let, let's make a, a service that this machine learning model will predict will be a, a, a friendly actor, a, a small resource consumer, but then when we're actually placed on physical hardware, we'll eat all the disk and RAM and take down the service and denial of service attack. So what's interesting about this attack is this is an, uh, an integrity violation of this small cog, but will lead to a global uh, system availability violation. Uh, last, last point I want to make about this attack is that um, people who build especially cloud infrastructure and they want to use the latest machine learning, they're not thinking about adversaries. They're not thinking that uh, something bad could happen. Uh, and there's this, uh, you know, there's this thinking that because it's not even accessible by the outside world, this model is hidden and protected. Of course, we know in information security that this is a, a fallacy. Let me run through this attack in detail. Um, I'll just briefly cover it. So, um, again, in honor of Cybersecurity Awareness Month, there's, there's no magic here. What happened is that we got inside using a, a fish. We gained insider access. The level of access was commensurate with my access as an intern at Microsoft. Um, uh, then we had great hopes to maybe launch as a very sophisticated algorithmic machine learning attack, but no, we realized that we could find the data and the code for this machine learning model service inside Microsoft. 
by just accessing this, we could build a, a copy of that machine learning model, study it offline, think about this as an offline brute force password attack, and then uh, discover what inputs we could input into the system to ca cause this noisy neighbor attack. Bottom line, uh, what we learn from attacks like this that are the most prevalent in machine learning today is that non-security models can have an outsized security impact. Uh, furthermore, internal models don't make them at all secure. So just because this is wrapped inside uh, an internal system doesn't make it unreachable to an attacker. And lastly, the most important element of machine learning security is the fundamental cybersecurity. So I want to I want to move from layer number one of of um, sort of fundamental security hygiene to the next layer up, and that would be the be the software stack. Um, machine learning, having been a machine learning engineer for a long time myself, I will I will concede to you that it is the wild west. That um, you know the the rules that apply to other software engineers often don't apply to machine learning engineers because we need special GPUs, we need special hardware, we need special data set. So, uh, and often much of, the, much of the research that's happening in machine learning comes and is borrowed from open source. What could be alarming about that is uh, that uh, there are many vulnerabilities in common AI libraries. That's, that's a growing number. Uh, in, uh, I guess, a, a few year old study we found 167 vulnerabilities in commonly used AI packages. Furthermore, there's uh, in, in common packages used by machine learning, attackers have subverted those supply chains to serve malware. So one example is the CTX package in Python. It was actually for about a month not serving CTX, but a, a Trojan CTX that would execute malware in your machine learning code. Lastly, there's a supply chain about um, machine learning models. <clears throat> so uh, we're moving from a world where people roll their own machine learning to a world where we borrow major components from open AI, from large model providers, because of the com uh, compute moat. And there's a dependency now to, to take these models uh, from third party. One such is called Hugging Face, if, you've, if you're familiar. Hugging Face is like the, the GitHub of machine learning, and anybody can post things on there, and anybody can use them. A challenge with that is uh, the model files themselves are based on the pickle file format, which opens the door to arbitrary remote ex code execution. So um, you can see, I think I may have a demo of that today, and you can try this for fun. If you'd like to, I, I promise this is totally harmless, but we'll demonstrate this whole idea. If you'd like to just uh, open your IPython browser and say from Transformers import auto model, and then load this model that I've uh, very uh, cleverly named Bert dash tiny dash torch dash vuln, that should be your first clue. Um, if you if you import this model, two things will happen. Number one, you'll get a totally legitimate model that you can use. But number two, a very chatty arbitrary code execution will happen as you do this. Now the real danger of course is that, uh, that uh, using a, a, a file will, will, will have a silent execution that you'll not know about, but this is intended to kind of uh, make you aware that by using these models you're exposing yourself to this kind of behavior. So that's the second, that's the second sort of uh, layer of, of security that I think this audience in particular will be aware of. I want to I want to um, maybe dovetail off of some of David's remarks and and uh, introduce also a third layer of security, and that's in the model and the algorithms themselves. And in the next few slides, I want to introduce a, a couple ways that not the software, not fundamental security, but the deployed services have had confidentiality, integrity, and availability attacks against, the, against them that exploit the math. They exploit the model themselves. So uh, again, so dovetailing off of, um, off of David's remarks, there's a couple of things that have happened because the actor has been mostly but e either, either a troll or a nation state, but to affect um, information. 
The first is the you know, now, now famous and popular Tay attack in 2016. Um, Microsoft Tay released this very cute bot that would interact with you on Twitter. And um, the, uh, the trolls on 4chan and Reddit amassed, and not by any sophisticated means, but by simply overwhelming the Twitter bot with uh, inappropriate conversations, Tay quickly became a misogynist bigot and was taken off in 16 hours after launch. So um, there, there's no sophistication here. This was just the brute force of the crude masses from the, from the internet. In a slightly more uh, maybe um, serious point, um, there, there are machine learning models that monitor, for example, Twitter for disinformation. And uh, they're not especially strong. So in 2021, uh, there was a backlash during the Uyghur campaign in China where Chinese uh, actors targeted David Pompeo based on his remarks. And in order to get this information at scale, they created a, a, a Twitter bot that would post from many different accounts. Now, normally this would be caught by the machine learning anti, uh, the anti -dis disinformation machine learning bots, uh, machine learning models that would catch these sorts of things. However, if you'll notice, these were evaded, how? By, by appending three tiny characters at the end of every tweet that were sufficient to confuse the, the detections from understanding that these were actually the same content. And it's sort of ridiculous how simple this evasion against a very sophisticated machine learning model is, but was totally successful. All right, um, a few more case studies um, where, uh, as, as I, wanna, I wanna break down um, kind, of, kind of who the actor is, what their purpose is, what, what their intent, how specific they were, how sophisticated they were. So in the case of this, this Twitter, incident, the, the, the actors here were, were not you know, nefarious actors, they were, they were trolls. Their specificity was actually really low. They, they didn't even know they were attacking machine learning. Um, their intent was simply to cause embarrassment to Microsoft uh, or, or, or cause a prank, and, and their sophistication was very low, it was just brute force. In, in the, um, th this, this sort of thing has actually played out recently, as recently as this year. So fast forward from 2016 to 2022, Meta has now released a new chatbot called Blenderbot 3. Um, hilariously, in their terms of service, they say uh, that you understand that you will not, you know, this is gonna make uh, an untrue and offensive statements and you agree not to trigger the bot. That, is not that does not stop the crowds that try to do these things. So um, very quickly, uh, Blenderbot 3, a very sophisticated chatbot released this year, also became a misogynist bigot. So um, if you analyze now the, the actors here, again, they're users and pranksters. Again, they're, they're, they're not targeting necessarily machine learning, but a black box system. Their intent is to deface, and their sophistication is extremely low. Um, in the, in the, the, uh, the Twitter campaign, again, this is slightly different because it, rather than being an actor that is just a troll, this is an actor that has a nation state objective. And um, the, the intent is political. Nevertheless, the sophistication is still relatively quite low. It's automated, but relatively simple. So one other sort of style of attacks against machine learning, that the math and the models of machine learning uh, we've seen recently is against um, ID.me. And I, I'm just curious if, if anybody has used this. Um, um, I have. ID.me is the service, for example, that uh, you've used to interact with the IRS to authenticate who you are, to get your tax return. And um, it, it uses, in part, facial recognition to identify that. So um, recently, there have been um, attacks against this uh, facial recognition service um, so that people can launch um, IRS credit card uh, 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 tax return scams. So well, how do they do this? They, they don't use fancy math. They, they wear, literally, they wear a mask. And the masks are hilariously bad. 
Um, but the ID.me system recognizes them as, as people and registers them to, to real accounts. So in this case, again, we have dishonest people as, as the actor. The specificity is um, quite low. They're, they're not manipulating any specific element of the math or the model. Um, the intent is to, is to uh, create uh, unemployment benefit claims, and the sophistication is quite low. This has happened a, a number of times. One, one of the more hilarious cases I find is a, a person who came away in a $3 million scam uh, by changing the color of his wig and the lighting and the state of his driver's license. So this is, this is, this is a real person who, who was uh, subsequently indicted. I want to point out that the, the system itself did the right job of matching a face to a driver's license. It did the wrong job of detecting multiple, you know, the, the same person registering many accounts. So uh, again, sophistication ex exceptionally low. Okay, so um, this is a, like, I, I, hope, I hope you're giggling at yourself inside how easy it is to fool machine learning. Now, there, there actually have been just recently some attacks that are clever and sophisticated against machine learning. I'm gonna highlight them here. Th this is courtesy of my colleagues at Norton LifeLock, uh, Kevin Roundy and CV Nodambra. And um, this is targeting a commercial w uh, phishing web page detector. So um, the way phishing web page detectors work is, um, this is important because you'll see that the attacker is targeting exactly these elements. Often they'll look at the content of the web page. They'll identify. They'll, they'll find logos. Like they'll look at the mic. Is there a Microsoft logo? Then, then you know, higher likelihood that this is a fish if it's not on you know a, a, a domain we control. They'll look at the words password and username, the text appearing on the page, and they'll they'll look at other subtle cues. And they, these become features inside a machine learning model used to detect phishing web pages. What you'll notice about each of these, each of these um, examples, these are fish pages that evaded the classifier. They evaded the model and were, de were detected as benign. And how? Well, you'll notice they, they, they misspelled or they put a dash in password so, so that the feature password was evaded. They changed the Office 365 the font is different here than the traditional Office 365. So the logo detection failed. Um, again, for Outlook, they erased the O. In the Rakuten, they, they striped, they, they, they obscured part of that so that the, the logo detection failed. And the machine learning model was unable to identify these as fish attempts. And if you were to find these web pages, you're all smart enough to know that like there's something weird here, back off. But for, for large portions of the target audience for these fish attempts, um, they, th this, this is a successful fish. So what's different and what's changing here is although there's, there's not a lot of clever math here, what is striking is that the attackers are specifically targeting machine learning. No longer a, a black box system or a, or a silly, you know, a chatbot, but but a sophisticated machine learning system intended to detect fish, and evade that. Okay. So um, I want to summarize this uh, this third this third layer of of unsophist relatively unsophisticated attacks against machine learning by um, summarizing kind of the actors, the specificity, the intent, and what we've seen. So actors, uh, pranksters, fraudsters, one nation state. Specificity, they've been indiscriminate mostly. They've been system level. Uh, we've seen one that has been specific to machine learning. Their intent has mostly been for defacement, politics, economic gain. What's, what's interesting as you summarize the attacks that we've seen in the wild against machine learning is that their sophistication to date has all been manual. So there's still, you know, there's still a person 
hand engineering these attacks. And if you, if you look, if you project what these will be in the future, this, will, this is the thing that's going to change. And I want to I want to highlight some of the ways that those will change based on the research that's been published for years and years, but we've not seen in the wild in practice. So um, a few a few things to point out is that every one of the CIA triad confidentiality, integrity, and availability, each of those violations can be played out against the math and the model in an algorithmic way. So. One of, one of the more popular ways to get at the, the confidentiality piece of a model is, are by attacks against machine learning that use an API just, so let me just query this cloud service, and by iteratively probing it, I can actually recover the training data. And it should blow your mind a little bit that I have no access to the data, I only have access to the query service, but by using the response from that as a feedback loop, I can sort of do gradient step climbing. I can estimate that and find out prototypical members of my approximations of the private training set. The reason is that uh, most machine learning engineers prioritize performance over protection. And they overfit models to specific instances of the training data, and those can be recovered algorithmically. An attack like this might cost 10,000 or 20,000 queries of an online service, but we can do this today. This is what we did at the Microsoft AI Red Team. I want to point out that to, that to remove the fear mongering, I've, I've never seen this with an attacker today. The reason is they don't have to. There are either easier ways. But as we, as we remove those tier one and two and three, as, as we're better there about security, this is where the attackers will turn to. Uh, so we need to be kind of get a step ahead of them here as well. A second style of attack um, uh, that's really interesting is um, a, a attack against stealing intellectual property. So um, this, this has happened for years and years, actually, um, in a legal way. But hosted services that are machine learning models take an input and give you a result. And Many attackers, benign or malicious, can use that input-output pairing, again, query 10,000 or 100,000 times to collect their own data set and copy your model. This is intellectual theft. Um, it's not illegal, actually, except as, as, it might, um, as it might violate some customer's terms of service. Lastly, um, there, there also are uh, availability attacks. So one clever uh, a colleague at University of Toronto demonstrated against a service at Azure is that uh, machine learning models are not, um, are, not compute, are not deterministic compute machines in that every, you know, every query takes the same amount of processing time. What they were able to discover is what input will cause the model, the service, to spend the most compute. So uh, by, by very carefully discovering this process, they can cost Azure more money and actually tie up the compute from uh, d uh, preventing other users from, from, from using that. So this is a, a very subtle denial of ser service attack against a specific hosted service. All right, so putting it all together, um, all of this, um, as you think about the prolifer proliferation of machine learning in our industry, there are so many places where we need to uh, ensure that we're protecting. It begins at the software and platform stack, but it also begins, there, there's also a piece for an attacker to be injected at every piece of the model development pipeline, from data curation, poisoning attacks, to the model training, to deployment and monitoring. So we, we've, we've investigated most of these in the previous slides, so I, I shan't um, like recount or summarize those. But, but think about, think about um, companies today who are really hungry to get on the EI train um, likely aren't considering each of these methods. So one, one, of the, one of the things that I hope that you'll take away today as security professionals, that you'll go and you'll help people think about in a security mindset the security implications of machine learning models. I want to um, pause a moment, and um, I, I made a statement earlier that I want to justify, and that is that um, 
we, we will see these more sophisticated algorithmic attacks. And the, the, my evidence for this hypothesis is based in traditional cybersecurity. If you'll recall, uh, you know, in the, in the 80s and 90s, there were viruses, um, but major breaches didn't, didn't happen a lot for monetary gain, actually until, you know, in, until the late 90s. So in, in the 1999, uh, two examples I like to cite were both by 15-year-olds who won Jonathan James um, uh, got a backdoor, uh, first through NASA and then got into the DOD um, and, and, and gained, gained some notoriety because of that, that breach. Another 15-year-old named Mafia Boy did a DDoS attack against uh, several large corporations. And why? Be because they could, right? The motivation was, was simply a proof of concept. Um, uh, research, academic research, was, very, was still actually quite mature, but in the wild, we saw this lag and people were just trying stuff, right? Um, it wasn't until 2005 that we saw our first data breach at a large corporation that, and I'm going to say large because it exceeded one million records. That was the first time, 2005. In, in, that, uh, in that breach, um, there was monetary incentive, credit card information was, was stolen. And finally, you know, this became kind of on the top of everybody's minds. Um, I worked at, uh, af after my time at the National Labs work at Mandiant, we released the APT1 report that uh, detailed about 150 attacks by the China uh, Cyber Esp Espionage Unit 61398. And because, because now we could link the attack with a, a, an entity, um, that became like a really scary thing for a lot of people. It's not, it's not a what, it's a who, and we know their address, and we know, we know the government that they're from. That same year was the year that uh, allegedly the FSB in, in Russia hacked, hacked uh, Yahoo and stole three billion accounts, which remains the largest hack of all time. And fast forward today, we now, now this is kind of routine where we can link an attack to a, 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 a major group, including you know, SolarWinds with APT29, Log4j, Use Wiley and APT41, and the, the Microsoft breach, allegedly, by the Lapsus Group in Brazil. So why do, why do I cover this when I talk about machine learning? It's, it's because, like, based on the maturity, like, we're still kind of in 1999 when it comes to attacking against machine learning. The deployed systems are still relatively immature. Um, the big one, there's, there hasn't been a big one yet. These are all mostly silly games that people are playing with wigs and masks. And um, someday, we'll have a big one. We'll, we'll, we'll be able to point to a, an APT actor causing this, and we'll see sophistication across many actors. That's when this will become real. So consider this maybe a, a sneak preview and, and a way for us all to get on board early um, to be prepared for when these might come. So as I want to um, transition here in the, we're good, in, in, as, as I'm wrapping up, when we adopt AI in our corporations, we also adopt the risk that comes with it. And I like to break these down into three pieces of a pie. The risk is operational. So this mostly concerns the machine learning engineering teams. Um, how, do I, um, how do I ensure that all the moving pieces of machine learning model are deployed correctly, that, um, that I, I can ensure uptime? Um, an example of a failure risk, uh, of risk in this area is um, one company I'm aware of um, produced a model but didn't sufficiently test it and the model would produce the same output regardless of the input. And uh, this caused the loss of millions of dollars. So that's the kind of operational risk I'm talking about. There's no actor involved. It's just, uh, it's just kind of the uh, Murphy's Law at, at play. The, the second pie of risk is, the, is responsible AI risk when there are you know, human-centric outcomes such as loan approvals that affect your financial, uh, your financial well-being. And machine learning has a lot to do here more and more as it's used to screen re resumes, to, uh, to surface job candidates, to uh, recommend um, 
recommend whether or not to be approved for a loan, these kinds of things. Um, th there's, a, there's a whole bunch of risk in there. The last slice of risk we've been focusing on today, focusing on today is the security and privacy risk where there is a threat. So um, if you break these down, like you know, 90% of the risk is actually not with an actor at play, but nevertheless is very important. This is, this is, um, this is Murphy, mostly. Mur Murphy and, and, and bad data. This is Mallory, and it, it's a small but um, growing piece of this, this risk. So nevertheless, how would we begin to address the defense of these kinds of uh, security risks against machine learning? And there, there's basically three categories uh, for a technology solution to defending against these risks. The first is a form of um, a vaccine of inocul inoculation that's come from the machine learning, uh, the adversarial machine learning research community. And it's, it's hardening, and it's, it's, it's a very simple concept that says, um, let, me, let me first fool my model. Let me make this model believe that this stop sign is actually a speed limit sign by changing a few pixels. But then I'll, I'll give it the right answer, say, no, 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 that, that is actually a stop sign, and I'll retrain this. And I do that thousands or millions of times to inoculate my model against, um, against attacks of this sort. So that's kind of a shift left sort of security. One should do it. It has ramifications of performance, unfortunately, that degrades performance while elevating its, its uh, uh, skepticism about unseen inputs. The second sort of style of attack is to detect when one might be trying to tamper with your system. And the, you know, the idea is really simple, is that before, before an input comes to my model, that I'll, I'll inspect that input and I'll determine if it might have some, you know, s there might be some intent to steal or to evade or to cause an availability violation of my model. So um, the first, all of you astute uh, folks will, will like, you know, you'll realize, well, if, if, if uh, I'm protecting a machine learning model with maybe machine learning, like what, what's forcing, what's preventing an attacker now from just evading that one? And the answer is absolutely. This is, this is a far, far from perfect scenario. If this is machine learning, then it's also susceptible to all the same sorts of attacks that this model is susceptible to. Um, so what, what's, you know, it, does that make detection a, a fruitless exercise? And I would argue no, that this is a fruitful exercise, that we need to raise the cost to an attacker. Um, just like you, I hope you have an antivirus on your laptop uh, that is easily evaded, uh, that, that you'll have that anyway because it, 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 it raises the cost to most attackers, except the very sophisticated ones. A last point um, I'll make is, uh, about de uh, detecting is that it's actually not that hard to detect when somebody's trying to do something bad to you. So if you take a look at this, I, I won't even explain what the axes are, and you, you'll, you'll immediately know that there's a difference between the left-hand side and the right-hand side. The left-hand side being normal, nominal user interaction with this model, uh, and the right-hand side being an algorithmic attack against the model. Uh, what I am showing is the model output score, where zero would be like false or no, and, and one would be true or yes. And in, in normal behavior, we see uh, for this particular model, uh, usage all across the, you know, very unstructured temporarily. But once we see an algorithm at play, we can break it down into phases. We see this quasi-periodicity in, in the patterns. So th these are not hard things to, to detect necessarily. Um, of course, this, if I were to build a detector, I could evade it myself. All right, a final, a final sort of techno technological solution to protect ourselves against adversarial attacks would be to actually have, um, uh, similar to you know, like a honeypot or, or obfuscation techniques, the same can be done in really clever ways with machine learning in which I add a noise to the output of my model, um, or I build in properties of my model so that when an attacker asks 
for a query and tries to get information over a long period of time, we as defenders gently lead them down a path, a false path. So these are very, very clever and fun uh, defensive mechanisms. Um, generally, attackers are trying to estimate gradient information about you know, which, which way is, like how should I modify my input to make this stop sign look like a speed limit sign? I can get that from the output. But um, what, what I can do instead is, while still returning the same answer to a normal user, give just enough falsehood to get them to step in the wrong direction and learn the wrong attack. So um, th this is a really fruitful area of research that I would encourage people to tap into. It's, uh, it's far from perfect and, and very nascent, but I think has a bright future. Okay, I have just a few slides to wrap up that I hope will um, encourage you in this audience to learn more about a relatively new attack surface. Um, with my colleagues at MITRE, we have uh, tried to copy the MITRE attack framework for endpoint security that shows attackers and techniques and mimic that in an ATLAS framework, which shows attackers and techniques against machine learning models. So you can go to atlas.miter.org and find um, a still very young um, uh, set of attacks and techniques against machine learning that you could maybe map to your own enterprise security uh, concerns. A second thing I'd like to point you towards is uh, I think one of the most significant reports from the United States government in the last uh, 18 months has been the National Security Commission on AI. And generally the report is about how does the United States um, maintain dominance in, in AI machine? How do we stay ahead with, uh, with, with aggressive investments from, from other countries? There's one chapter dedicated to wait a second, while we're investing in this, let's make sure we have data assurance and model assurance. Let's make sure we're doing this responsibly. And I think it's a really healthy dialogue, especially um, coming from uh, the US government. This is, um, you know, what, what I find interesting is that where industry has led in AI adoption over the government and defense, defense and government has led in assurance over industry. So industry has become more vulnerable than the, than the, the defense industry in terms of uh, providing assurance mechanisms to adopting AI. Last is a bit of a plug uh, for learning more. Uh, my colleague uh, at Microsoft, Ram Shankar Subkumar, and I are authoring a non-technical book that uh, all proceeds will go to charity. This, this is nothing for us, but just a, a passion project. I hope that you would check out uh, early next year that will go through stories and anecdotes. Uh, the, the intended audience is, is not the technical folks like you, it's decision makers that will uh, make people aware that you can do really silly things to very, uh, very smart math. And um, in this book also, we talk about not just the technology, but also the policy implications behind this. And, um, and encouraging AI to move forward, but with kind of the right safeguards in place. So in summary, AI is eating the world. It's being adopted in every industry from uh, the Twizzlers you're gonna eat tonight for Thanksgiving, uh, for, for, uh, for uh, Halloween rather. Hope you don't have too many Twizzlers for Thanksgiving. To, to makeup, to self-driving cars, it's everywhere, but it also means that AI risk is also being adopted everywhere. And um, risk management is a, is a new frontier that uh, we can get into to help make sure that we're assuring the safe adoption of AI as we progress. Thank you. <laughs> Shall I take questions? Time for questions. Thank you, Dr. Hiram, for your insightful presentation. Thank you. Hello. Um, so do we have like a good measuring framework, say, in the early stage, of those uh, when we're developing the models, so we can either evaluate the uh, unconscious bias from the uh, training model itself, or kind of conscious tinted model, and how badly has that skewing the, uh, the AI decision making? So do we have any kind of framework to help us with the early detection and measurement for that? 
Uh, a great question. And I would say we're in the early phases here. So um, especially in the responsibility piece with bias, um, this has been a longstanding problem. And the best cases I know of are just uh, pre-production tests. This is actually what I do. My, my company, Robust Intelligence, we provide testing for models. Before you deploy it, let's make sure that, 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 that we have equal, we, we serve every population in the data set equally, for example. Um, in terms of the security pieces, um, it's unclear that bias in data sets alone is the cause of influence. In fact, it's, it's more just a property of the model itself, regardless of the data. Still, there are tests that one can run there, similar to how we would run a vulnerability scan on a piece of software, we can run vulnerability scans on the models themselves. Um, that doesn't fix it, but it gives you at least awareness and a measurement of the risk before you deploy. So I, I think, I think the, your framing of that was, was perfect. Um, how do you measure? Unfortunately, measuring is almost all we can do today. We're still working on the fixing. Great question.